I'm Catherine McCapagal. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a research associate professor uh, of medical social sciences um, at, and at the Institute of Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing, or ISGEM, at Northwestern University. Um, I am um, so delighted to be here with my co-panelists and co-organizers, um, Lauren Beach, Cindy Veldheis, and Gilbert Gonzalez, who I will um, allow them to introduce themselves uh, in just a couple minutes. Um, uh, but yeah, we're really excited that everyone is here. Um, you know, if you would like to, um, I think we collected Twitter handles from registrants, but if you would like to, you know, um, uh, the attendees go ahead and kind of introduce yourself over chat so folks can, um, um, you know, just name, pronouns, affiliation, um, uh, you know, sort of if you're a faculty, postdoc, student, or another position, um, and maybe your I'm asking you to do a lot here on <laughs> your Twitter handle. And if you want to say something about briefly about like the topic area or like the population or whatever you work with, feel free. Um, just so folks can kind of get to know each other um, a little bit as, you know, as we're as we're speaking. Perfect. Okay. So um, what to expect today. So I will um, introduce the session a little bit and talk to you about um, you know, like what our goals are today. And then um, the rest of the session is us kind of talking a little bit about these different points um, about, you know, what we think is important for you to sort of know about getting started with Twitter, or if you already use Twitter, um, you know, what's, what's important about kind of paying attention to your presence and building networks and that sort of thing. Um, and I think this first part is really going to be us sort of giving relatively informal presentations. Um, um, and kind of discussing amongst ourselves, um, you know, things that, you know, we think are um, important for you to take away, our own experiences um, using Twitter, et cetera. Um, we have a fair amount of time for question and answer. Um, we got a few questions from the registration, which I um, have on a slide uh, um, for the Q&A session. But again, like as things come up, please, um, please feel free to ask, you know, this time is really for y'all. Um, and then we built in probably at least 20 minutes at the end to have sort of some hands on time with Twitter. Um, you know, uh, if you don't already have a Twitter, we'd love for you to, you know, consider starting one today. Um, if you already have a Twitter kind of, you know, spending the time connecting with folks, maybe writing a tweet using the LGBTQ health conference um, hashtag. Um, connecting with others and that sort of thing. And as questions come up for you, um, you know, we're here to answer them for the, to the best of our ability. So um, let's see here. Uh, I am not paying attention to too many chat things. So if anything comes up, fellow panelists, please let me know. Um, but I will kind of move on here. So, um, so I always like to start like every talk that I give with like, like caveats that I have. So what, pre what we're presenting here is not brand new. Um, it's not comprehensive. You know, I think that a lot of this information is already out there, but I know that a lot of us um, in academia don't often get trained on how to do this. We just sort of figure it out on our own. So, you know, we'd like to acknowledge a variety of um, uh, presentations and resources that we drew from um, uh, Lauren and their colleagues, Mike Mead and Sadia Khan um, at Northwestern gave a similar presentation like this a couple of months ago. Um, Brian Mastansky shared some slides with me. Um, there are folks that some of us have sort of been aware of, Daniel Quintana, Casey, Casey Fiesler, Sarah Mojera, and Miria Holman, um, who have resources that we think are really great that um, I have a slide for at the very end of the presentation um, that kind of do a bit of a deeper dive into, you know, Twitter for academia, um, the op-ed project, and many others. I would really, um, I'm so grateful to our panelists for um, saying yes to um, my crazy request when I asked you to join me here today. Um, I really appreciate you all um, sharing your time and wisdom, and, um, you know, they're far more popular on Twitter than I am, so I could stand to learn something from them today. Um, I'd also like to thank the um, uh, planning committee for the National LGBTQ Health Conference um, here at Northwestern, who, um, you know, kind of supported this session and are kind of making the conference happen. So Sarah Klain, Shannon Sotomayor, 
Janine Maj, Young Lee, David Moskowitz, and Brian Mostansky, and to you all for your attendance and for your um, enthusiasm about learning about this topic. Um, we're so glad that you're interested in this um, and that you are here today. So um, uh, I wanted to share some of our networking hopes for you all. So during today's session, you know, again, feel free to connect um, with each other and with us on Twitter. Um, I think many of you who might have registered in the last, like up until maybe a couple of days ago, might have been added to a Twitter list that says National LGBTQ Health Conference um, that's associated with our ISGM, our ISGMH Twitter account. So you can find a lot of people there. Um, after today's session, um, so part of the reason why this pre-conference session is so far ahead of the conference, which happens in May, uh, May 20th and 21st, is because we wanted folks to have time to get comfortable using Twitter um, and sort of connecting with each other in advance of the conference. Um, so we really encourage you to sort of, you know, get more comfortable using Twitter for the next month. Um, see how you feel about, you know, interacting with people versus lurking and sort of where you're at there. And then we encourage folks who are attending the conference to use Twitter during the conference um, in a variety of different ways, retweeting folks, sharing your takeaways from other people's work, you know, doing a bit of self-promotion. If, if, if you have a poster at the conference, you know, you're welcome to sort of post your poster and sort of stand by it and then have people ask you questions on Twitter. Um, and then also network with folks that you like and you know follow them, interact with them, ask to connect if you feel comfortable doing that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. So without further ado, let's do some introductions. I will not introduce myself more yet because I feel like I've been talking a lot. I'll pass it off to, um, let's see, maybe I'll have Cindy introduce herself first. And then when y'all make the rounds, I'll introduce myself last and kind of continue talking for a few minutes before I hand it off again. So, um, Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy Baltike. I am an associate research scientist at Columbia University. I have a K-99 to study queer intimate relationships. Um, I do have a Twitter account and I am excited to talk more about some of my thoughts behind it and some of the really stupid mistakes I made in creating it. Um, and I think that's probably it. I'm also a psychologist, but I'm a research psychologist. Well, Lauren. Yes, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren Beach and I use they and she pronouns. I am a research assistant professor at Northwestern in the Department of Medical Social Sciences, where I'm also a core faculty at the Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing. And I have been a Twitter user since 2006. Uh, my current Twitter only goes back to 2009, however, and I'm a big fan of the platform and I can't wait to chat with you all more later um, about that. Good afternoon, my name is Gilbert Gonzalez. I'm a health services researcher at Vanderbilt University. I'm an assistant professor of medicine, health and society and health policy. And I study how public policy affects uh, access to care and health outcomes for LGBT people. And I'm looking forward to uh, sharing my uh, experiences using the Twitter platform. Cool, and um, you know, as I said, I'm Catherine McCapagal. You can also say my last name, McCapagal. Um, I use she/her pronouns. I'm a faculty here at Northwestern University. Um, I started join or I joined Twitter um, back uh, uh, in February 2017, um, mostly just to lurk. Honestly, like I was not interested in connecting with people academically at the time. I was really afraid of Twitter. The only reason why I joined Twitter was just to like follow the news and like follow local news sources. And then it sort of evolved over time where I started liking academic related things and tweeting about them. And then, you know, kind of um, telling you about like what snacks I'm eating while grant writing, which is like cur my current sort of Twitter persona. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, let's kind of move along here. So I'll say a little bit about getting started with Twitter and why it's important. So um, why are we doing this? So um, as everybody has experienced, we are basically tethered to our computers and, and virtual spaces for doing everything these days, um, including for networking. Um, and, you know, in my own experience and a lot of folks that I've talked to, 
you know, at many virtual conferences over the past year, the sort of bumping into people piece and like running into people during breaks and, um, you know, meeting people for happy hours or whatever, that part is just not, not really existent at this point. Um, and so there are a lot of missed opportunities um, for profession, professional connections, personal connections, and, you know, kind of potential collaborations. Um, for everyone, but I think especially folks who are earlier in their career, graduate students, postdocs, early career faculty who are really trying to get out there, make a name for themselves, meet other people, um, and um, and kind of form their networks. So, um, so we wanted to use focus on Twitter at this particular conference because we thought it was kind of a more sustainable way of networking. Um, it's free. It doesn't really depend on the conference app or website that you're using. Um, and there are a ton of people um, out there on academic Twitter. So, um, so we wanted you know, folks to have an opportunity to sort of learn about it um, and, and potentially consider using it um, you know, to sort of elevate your work and the work of others. Um, you know, I think that it's also our perspective on this panel that, you know, we think that academics have a responsibility to make their scholarly work accessible to the public and to learn to better communicate about their science. I think when I was kind of coming up in the world, I had this idea that people, um, like I would do good science and people would just find out about it and it would get covered in like a newspaper or some, something like that. But, but um, you know, when I, when I learned a little bit more about that, how that happens, you know, part of it is sort of self-promoting, you know, yourself or sort of sharing more about the work that you do and, and allowing other people to sort of find out about it that way rather than kind of waiting for them to sort of find the journal article that you wrote. Um, so, so I think that's, you know, why science communication, particularly using Twitter is, is, is important. And I think all of us, you know, find that Twitter's benefits in the professional space have really outweighed its drawbacks in our opinions. Um, you know, as I meant, I might've mentioned this earlier uh, that, you know, when I first started using Twitter, I was really afraid of getting trolled. I was really afraid of, you know, just kind of bad things happening to me. And like, although there have been like a couple of instances that, you know, kind of were not great, like on by and large over the last several years, I have significantly benefited from, from it professionally in a number of different ways, including forming um, collaborations with people I met on Twitter, um, um, writing papers with people I met on Twitter that I have like still not met in person, um, you know, being asked to, you know, being asked to, um, you know, do things because I had a Twitter presence um, uh, and making friends with other academics who seemed cool on Twitter, which I think um, uh, um, are some of the many kind of benefits that, that I've experienced with it. Um, and the others will sort of speak to that as well. Um, there are a variety of ways to use Twitter, as you probably know by now. Um, these kind of ways were adapted from um, the presentation that Lauren gave with their colleagues um, a couple months ago. Obviously, professional networking, disseminating your work, sharing resources, recruiting for your research studies, asking other people for resources and advice. One way that I actually found Twitter to be super useful is um, I'm an associate editor for a journal, and I had a hard time finding reviewers. And I just said, are there any grad students or postdocs or early career folks who want to review in these areas that like I handle for this journal because nobody is saying yes. And I had like 60 people say yes. And I actually reach out to those people to review for me, which is, which is great. So, um, so I think that's, you know, one example of like sort of a success. Um, and my sort of editor or my edits to this other ways to use Twitter, obviously increasing your own visibility amplifying others work that you think is really cool and you know deserves to be sort of seen more um, finding support from your colleagues like if you know if you're the type to sort of say that you're having a hard day on Twitter like most likely your colleagues might also be having a hard day and having that virtual support net network is sort of nice and then I you know I sort of mentioned earlier that I have I have made some friends on the internet so that that has been a cool thing too um, and this is my last slide, I believe, before I turn it over to Cindy. Um, you know, as you're getting started, it's important to think about, you know, what your goal is for your social media presence. Like, do you want it to be exclusively professional, exclusively personal? Do you want it to be a little bit of both? Do you want to have separate personal and professional accounts, um, you know, et cetera? And um, even though you might start out with a certain goal, like I said, I didn't 
like mine was like exclusively like lurking and personal, it's okay for your Twitter presence and engagement to evolve over time. Like I know there are people who might be super active for a while, but then they stop and then they like re-engage and things like that. I think that, you know, there there's no one right way to use Twitter, but there are a lot of kind of things to avoid or advice that we can give you based on our collective experiences. And I know that some of you here um, in attendance are also using Twitter and, you know, feel free to share, um, you know, your advice and experiences as well. So um, some of the things that we'll share with you today are things that like, you know, we might encourage you to think about or considerations or things to avoid, um, you know, as you as you kind of continue to use Twitter in your life. So with that, I will turn it over to Cindy to talk about our first topic of branding and self-presentation. Thank you, Catherine. First, I want to put a little plug in for the conference, the National LGBTQ Health Conference. It, it was the second LGBT conference I attended, and it's by far the best one. I think in terms of the size is really manageable that you can really get to know people when you're there. The connections that I made there have been really valuable in the long term. The content is really excellent, and it just felt like a really good place to go. And um, I really encourage anyone who can to attend it, both virtually and eventually when we're able to do it in person. You can go to the next slide. I think one of the important things to ask yourself when you're creating your Twitter account is what effect do you want to have on the world at large? And I'll talk a little bit about different audiences in a bit. Um, but think about, like, the people in your larger cohort, so people who are at your level, if you're a PhD student, what impact do you want to have on other PhD students? Um, what impact do you want to have on potential mentors or your current mentors? It's a little bit weird sometimes when your current mentors are also on Twitter. You can't really, um, you have to worry sometimes about what you say and if you complain about things, um, like if you're having challenges, you may worry about what people think about that. There's an article in the New York Times recently where PhD student in clinical psychology was talking about how she's struggling during the pandemic and she didn't want her location to be shared because she was so worried about faculty and other students learning that she was having a hard time. So I think it can be a little bit challenging to figure out what you want to share and because you might be sharing it with those people. Um, potential employers and then the broader impacts. What broader impacts do you want to have with your Twitter account, um, like socio-political impacts? Um, and a little bit about my thinking behind mine. I, when I started, I didn't really have any sense as to what I wanted to do. I just thought I should get on Twitter because it seemed like it was a good networking tool. I remember the very first time I used Twitter, I didn't understand how people were learning anything whatsoever from it because like everything that was coming up in my timeline really had nothing to do with current events. And people had told me like, it's the best way to learn about things like immediately as they're happening. And I think over time I've shifted my the people that I follow and I am getting better information and more connected to my network. Um, and I think Gilbert will talk about this a little bit more. Um, so over time, I've wanted to really promote LGBT research. And I think I've done that less than I would like to. Um, one thing that I've done a lot is that I've done a lot of trying to do professional development on my Twitter account. Um, and I didn't insert slides in here of things that I've done with that. but. Um, if you go to my account, the very first pinned tweet is one that I shared. It's on how to do presentations and posters in PowerPoint, how to create them. So when I, I do a lot of presentations on things like productivity, graphic design, um, how to make graphs and charts for posters and presentations. Um, so the other ones are, oh, how to write a K99, KL1, how to write an F32, and my processes around those. Um, my pandemic kitten is kind of acting up today, so if she does crazy things in the background, um, it's just fodder for fun, I guess. I gave her some bubble wrap to play with because she likes to jump into it, so I'm hoping that that distracts her from other weird things. Um, so I try to do a lot of that online, and I think I've gotten a reputation for that, and I've actually even gotten some paid speaking engagements from different universities to talk about some of these things, which has been kind of a nice bonus that I didn't expect. And I also try to, um, maybe less than I would like to, um, try to normalize some of the challenges that I face in academia. Um, I want to sort of be a real person. I was talking to someone who had offered to mentor me recently, and I said something about, like, it's really odd meeting people um, who know you by this persona that you've created on the internet. And she was like, well, I'm exactly who I am on Twitter. And I, I think I am who I am, but I'm less of a dork, I think, on Twitter. I'm a little bit better than I am in real person in real life. 
And I think that that's kind of what I want to get across is that I want to be a slightly more polished um, yet still accessible version of myself. Um, and I didn't mean when I said that that I wasn't really who I was, but um, I think that's how it came across. Next slide. So um, I worked for a year, I had a, a break in my PhD program and I worked for a year in marketing. Um, and I think one of the things that is really important within marketing is talking about branding. And so part of thinking about what impact you want to have on the world um, is thinking about what your brand is. And I'm really saying I put a timer and I have three minutes left. I can't believe I spent four minutes on that last slide. So will go a little bit quickly. But think about like the photo that you use, the handle that you create for yourself, the bio that you write for yourself, and kind of what impact you want those to have on people. And I have a slide where I have some examples. Um, if the handle, though, is, has nothing to do with your name, it can be hard for people to find you. Um, and it can be hard for people to remember your handle. I have a student who works with me who uses an anonymous account, which I think is really valid and important, but I can never remember who she is on Twitter. So when I try to find her, it's really challenging for me. Um, so let's see what's the next slide has my examples. So we'll go to that. So here are some examples. So just hit um, the space bar once. So this is um, Dr. R.G. Raystar and their handle, their bio. Um, they have nice little flags in there to be really quick signifiers of their queer identity. Um, next one. Some of these people might be on this. Uh, this is really nice because he put his Google Scholar account as a link in there and has really nice information about him. So you get a sense of the personal and the professional. Next one. Jose Diaz. Um, I really like it because he's got his dog, which always is a good attention getter, and has an er interesting picture of himself. So you remember him, and the flag, the rainbow flag, is good. Kimberly really Aquaviva is an amazing person. I like that she has some humor in her bio, so it's easy to remember and it makes her really accessible. Um, and then I like that she says, "These are my own and don't represent my employer at all." So it's very clear that she's making it clear that she is not representing her university. And that's an important thing to put in there if you're using your own identity and you're at an institution. The next one, maybe we can just go through these quickly. Go ahead and keep going. Pearl Street. Um, so some people have put um, the location in there, including the, um, the tribal lands that they're located on, which I think is a really nice Thing to add to your bio. I think it's increasingly important to acknowledge that. Next. Yeah, we can just keep going. Cute dogs, always a good attention getter. One thing I liked about that one is that this is clearly a professional account because she put her center in there along with her photo. You get a very clear sense as to what the intention of her account is. I keep going. I think that's one of the last ones. Next slide. So I think one of the key considerations is how much do you want your Twitter account to be personal and how much do you want it to be professional? Um, I think that there's a really fine line to ride um, particularly when you think about the next slide, go ahead, Catherine. Like, who are the disparate audiences? So I mentioned this before. Um, if you are potentially going to use your own name, your own identity, then potentially your mentors could see it, like I mentioned earlier, your colleagues could see it, other classmates could see it. And so being careful about what it is that you share online may be important. Um, also, if you do clinical work or you plan to do clinical work, being careful about what you put on there about your personal life because clients may see it, um, patients may see it, students may see it, um, parents of students may see it. So being aware that not just who you know to be your audience now, but who may be your audience later on and who can find your tweets later. Like if you plan to run for political office at some point, um, be careful about what you put in there. And next slide. The next consideration is whether or not you're on the market or you plan to go on the market. So this is the job market. And this was something when I went on the market last year, I was really quite concerned about, particularly because I'm very political myself. And I had a lot of concerns about whether or not I should talk about political things on my Twitter account. And I came to the conclusion that 
to uh, not talk about things was worse than to talk about things because it was very important to me to be able to talk about things that were going on politically because it just was morally reprehensible to not do so. I, I think though that you really do have to think about it and to sort of think about the implications of it. I think we can tend to sort of put things on the internet and not worry or know what the implications could be, especially people who have been raised with social media their entire lives. Um, but think about how you present yourself and what it is that potential employers could think about you or your work um, based on what it is that you're tweeting about. And I'm not saying that you need to be overly worried that you need to censor yourself at all, but just sort of like um, con informed consent that you basically go through a process where you're making sure that you're making informed decisions. Next slide. Just briefly make sure that you know what your institution's guidelines are about twittering. Um, mine has some clear guidelines that they handed out to us, including that they don't really want us to ask them. They don't want us to tweet at them about things. So um, I can let them know if there's something that's going on, like if I have a new publication or something, but they don't want me to ask them um, because they want to handle what shows up on their page. So make sure that you know what their guidelines are. Um, and if you put something on there about making sure that people know that the things that you tweet about are your own um, thoughts, so that can be really helpful to sort of the fact that you're separate from your institution. Next slide. So one thing that comes up is people wonder about how queer to be on the internet um, and also in the job market. And I think this is something that's really important to think about. Some people say like uh, if you are on the market and you're looking for jobs that you don't want to hide that part of yourself because you don't want to be someplace that's not going to be supportive of your queer identity, your queer research. And I think that that's really important. I think it's also important to think about the flip side of that, and that is the current state of the job market and whether or not it's better to have a job where um, it's maybe less supportive, but you at least have a job versus um, whether or not, uh, or whether you just wanna be someplace that's 100% supportive of you. I'm not saying that there's a right answer there. Some people have to make really tough uh, decisions based on their own personal circumstances, um, but just be aware of those kinds of things. Um, and I think that's all I want to say about that. So next slide. That's just my information and a really cute rainbow dog. That's it for me. Um, I'll turn it over to Lauren for Twitter analytics and engagement. Thanks so much, Catherine. I really appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen. So let me get that set up. Um, okay, is everyone seeing my browser? Awesome. Great. So, and like other folks on, I think everyone else on the panel today, I am not going to use PowerPoint for the chat that we're going to have because instead of that, I really wanted to take folks through some resources that I think are really helpful to, to know about and just show you them as they exist online. So the main focus of my, of my talk is going to be on analytics and not just Twitter analytics, but other ways that you can use Twitter to understand the reach that you have and who you're reaching and the impact that that has. So the first thing I wanted to talk about since this is an academic Twitter chat, um, you know, as part of an academic pre-conference session was Altmetric. Um, can I get some emoji responses <laughs> maybe in the, in the on people's screens if you've heard of altmetric maybe a thumbs up yes i'm seeing some thumbs ups great um gonna look through everybody because we've got three screens on here today so altmetric is a platform that allows tracking of the reach of scientific papers to the public both via traditional media sources and by social media and so the first thing that I have up here, in case you want to kind of also follow along, we have some time later on in the session as well for people to actually demo things. But if you want to do this right now, I'm going to put this in the chat. Um, you can download the altmetric tool it's called Bookmarklet. And let me see where my chat go. Here we go. Right here. You can download this and it lets you integrate Altmetric into your browser. So if once you go through these steps, you'll see this little tab up here, I'm using Chrome, and it will allow you when you pull up a paper to click it and it'll show you 
the altmetric statistics just automatically for whatever scientific paper you might be looking at. And so a little bit more about altmetric. So I'm pulling up a paper of mine that was published in 2018 that has the highest altmetric score that was received in the Journal of uh, Pediatric Diabetes. And the reason why that high score happened was both because of social media engagement and also because I worked with the communications team at Northwestern Feinberg for them to write a press release about the study and to, to send it out um, globally. And so what you'll see here is that um, if I click on the summary for this paper, you can see it shows you like where was most of the media coverage uh, for your paper centered. It shows you a breakdown of who was tweeting of it about your paper. Is it members of the public, scientists, or in the case of mine, another category that came up was practitioners like healthcare professionals. And uh, what you can see also is this little summary on the left and tells you about the attention score, which is this uh, colored graphic here. And it tells you, it compares your attention score for the paper to other attention scores for papers that are similar, both from similar journals, the same journal, and um, you know what the uh, of, of papers of the same age that are out there. And it also gives you a summary here of where you've been mentioned. So if you're curious, you can track the news outlets that have written about your paper. You can see the tweets that have come out about your paper. It gives you a little summary here. So, um, so far, their altmetric has seen 20 tweets from 13 users with an upper bound of 37,183 followers. A quick tip about this, there were actually more tweets that came out about this paper at the time, but not all of them were using the link that altmetric was tracking. So altmetric, if you want people to, if you want your tweets and social media posts to show up um, in the tracking uh, page here for your paper, I think it's best if you share uh, from the direct from the journal itself, if you click share, you'll get a link and then you can use it. You can also um, put the link into like a bit.ly or a shortener um, and then have it be tracked. So um, some other things about that. Is there any questions about Altmetric, about how to get to it, how to find your papers, etc? Nope. One thing that I think is really powerful about this is that in terms of media and social media, it's the single, it's far more, people are far more likely to engage your work if they read about it in a media source or on social media than if, if you, than they are likely to read your peer reviewed scientific article. So uh, for that reason, I also put altmetric scores in like how they compare in terms of other uh, research pieces in the same journal or in with a particular audience on my bio sketch and in my CV, like it gives you a sense, it gives people a sense of how widely your work is reaching the public. And that of course is really important because uh, public awareness to science is helpful in terms of keeping people informed and even shaping public health policy. All right, so with that, next thing I'm going to do is go to Twitter. And what you're seeing right now, hopefully is a picture of my Twitter page. I go through times when I'm active on Twitter and times when I'm less active. Right now I'm kind of in a more less active phase since the pandemic. <laughs> kind of hit, um, but I, I, as things pop up that are important or that I wanna get the word out about, I, I go on and I'm more active. And one thing I wanted to, to say, um, to show you though, specifically about Twitter, how to use it is analytics. So if you click on more, if you're logged into your profile, you click on analytics and it will pull up this page and it shows you just some very quick summaries of month by month, like what your presence looks like on Twitter. So it'll tell how many tweets have you sent? What are your impressions? How many people have visited your profile? Um, how many mentions do you have on Twitter and how many followers do you currently have? It also shows the top tweet that you have that month, who are the followers you have. Um, and then you can see my top mention of course is this session because this is what we're doing here together today. But I wanna say, so I've only sent two tweets this month and I don't have very many impressions. And, but if I keep on going down and I go to say months where I've been more active, which my last time that was much more active was about a year ago, you can see um, a lot more impressions. So Twitter is a very effective platform to be able to get a broad audience. And so, a lot of what uh, my mentions get driven up by is the fact that I talk about bisexuality and I really am part of conversations on by Twitter. So I'll put that hashtag in the chat too. So by Twitter. And 
uh, I want to use that also as a transition into just talking about the power of hashtags. Now, Gilbert dropped the hashtag academic Twitter in the chat. I just dropped by Twitter in the chat. And the reason that I wanna do that is to talk about how the Twitter algorithms work. So um, basically you can think of hashtags as a type of search index for Twitter. If you wanna find conversations that are helpful and relevant to you and your work or communities you're interested in or political topics or what have you, hashtags are a way to do it. And so um, I want to talk about giving an example now uh, for other ways you can use hashtags other than driving, just engaging with conversations on Twitter and getting people to see your work um, if they are part of a certain community, which is that you can also register hashtags. If you're doing an event like this, you're doing a conference, you wanna have a community event, you wanna have any sort of public facing program that you want to connect into social media, registering a hashtag is a really powerful way to be able to bring people into that conversation. So first things first, if you were thinking about a hashtag for your event, the first, the, what you need to do immediately is put it into Twitter and see if someone else is already using it. And, and if so, how they're using it. <laughs> because you might be surprised that your acronym has been thought of by other people who do something totally different than you do. Um, other things to note, if you are doing LGBTQ community organizing work, if you use hashtags that are directly like bisexual, Twitter, gay, it's not uncommon that that, because um, Twitter also allows X-rated content. Sometimes you will pull up X-rated content with hashtags on Twitter and you may not know that that might happen. So you need to check ahead of time to see if the hashtags that you're going to use, um, even if they're community centered, may also have other audiences that are using that same tag. So um, right here, I'm gonna drop these uh, links into the chat for resources. You can learn more about like the process of how to register a hashtag, which we're not gonna go through today due to time. But um, I wanted to show you just some output for what it can, uh, what the effects can be from having a, a hashtag in terms of reach. So this is just a, a blog post about like a comprehensive guide about hashtags, what to do. And then this is a website where you can actually register a hashtag and you can do it for free. You don't have to pay. Uh, but of course, if you pay, you would have access to like the bells and whistles of the websites that allow you to register. But um, I'm going to give an example now. I'm going to stop sharing this screen. I'm going to go to another screen right now. Go to this is output uh, of an event that I had registered a hashtag for that was done in partnership with the ACE Foundation of Chicago. Um, it was called We See You. It was a conference, a symposium on, on, on racial, racial equity and bisexual health. And so um, what you can see is so I registered this hashtag ahead of time. And one of the things, if you use a free registration um, approach, and you're not paying for it, you kind of have to download the report that you get from the, re the registration site every so often because uh, tweet impressions will quickly be, come obsolete. They'll become obsolete and they won't be in your report. But just to give you a sense, like the first day that I was looking at this conference, this We See You conference, um, over a million impressions just by registering this hashtag, right? You can see more. There were 100 tweets that went under this hashtag. There were 38 contributors over 21 hours. You can look at who were the top contributors. So you see part of why we had a big reach is that we also had a celebrity, Sara Ramirez, uh, retweet some of the content from this conference. And so that helped us because one thing that will really drive your impressions up is if you have people who are have a lot of followers retweet your content that will drive everyone of course sees the hashtag they know about it they can look at other tweets and then just you benefit from their online social capital and their online presence um, to have more people be shown this information so you can also see like who were the contributors what were some of the tweets like this is just a free report that came out when I downloaded one a few days later, you can see that there were additional impressions that had been found, um, but not all of the contributors are the same and not all of the content was the same. Uh, and so when I, when I did a summary overall and I did, I did a breakdown, it looked like we probably had about um, one to two million impressions, although it could have been as high uh, as three to four million and there are probably two to three million unique Twitter users who were reached by this hashtag. So that compared to the number of people who would read a scientific journal article, 
right? <laughs> Especially since this conference was disseminating academic findings as well as having community members tell their stories and, and, lift their, and share their voices. So there really is no, uh, <laughs> no, 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 like it's like apples and oranges, right? About who you're gonna reach and how much, how, how wide your reach will go. Some things I wanna point out, one more thing I wanna share, this is an analytical output. Like if you go to Twitter and you go to analytics, you can actually download uh, an Excel, a CSV file of your tweets and look at each one and the number of impressions, when it was tweeted, what the content was, et cetera. So I'm gonna show that. It's my last thing I'm gonna do. Um, so where is it? Okay. So this is again, was the analytics from the We See You event, but these particularly are only from my Twitter account. So these are the tweets that I sent. And in that one half day symposium, if you go down to the number of total impressions, just from my Twitter account, 100, almost 125,000 impressions from tweeting about that symposium, right? So again, huge uh, compared to traditional academic routes of dissemination. And so here you can see like every single tweet, you can see the number of impressions that each tweet got. Some of them are, are higher than others. The ones that are highest, of course, are the ones that were tweeted by bigger accounts. So that's, that's an important thing, like your followers and how many followers they have influences how the reach of your tweets. Another thing that can really help boost the, the presence of the number of impressions, et cetera, that you're going to get in your tweets is going to be uh, the media content. So if you have a URL, that can drive Twitter's algorithm to share your tweet more. If you have media, meaning like pictures or graphics or you know some other visual content, Twitter's algorithm picks that up and shares it more because they consider it to be more compelling. Um, and so more people are going to see it if you actually have something besides words in your, in your Twitter content. And uh, you can also track in the analytics, it'll tell you like how many people actually viewed the, the media that you put, like a link or a picture, et cetera. You can look at your click rate, you can look at your retweets, you can look at your engagement rate. There's all these different nerdy breakdowns that you can get <laughs> if you export the little analytics uh, spreadsheet out of Twitter, which you can do completely for free. So hopefully this gives you a sense of um, the power of Twitter to reach people. And again, I think I wanna echo Cindy's comments about reaching, like thinking about who your audience is and who your branding is because for me, I know on my Twitter account that I'm going to have content that is about bisexuality, whether it's science or community or identity, that is going to go a lot more, uh, it's going to go, that, the reach of that will be a lot higher than if I tweet about other topics, because my audience is very interested in that content that I post. And you can see it that my, my Twitter profile itself is, is very heavily uh, bisexually branded, if you will. <laughs> so there's no, I think it even says by certain bisexual in my uh, Twitter bio. And of course, it's it, I was you know that's been my online presence since before I decided to go into academia or LGBTQ health or anything else. Like, I've been out online since two thousand four, two thousand six. I don't know, but yeah, no questions there. Like, out all the way. <laughs> and uh, I consider that one of the most powerful things about Twitter is the ability to give back to bisexual communities the information um, scientifically that is you know, being generated, being published, et cetera, and like thinking about how can we connect this, the activists and advocates and bisexual community organizations with the scientific work that's ongoing and how can we shift health policy to build a better future. So, um, but yeah, that's all I have, I think. And I see some comments in the chat. Let me take a quick look. Yes. All right, well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gilbert. Thanks, Lauren. And I don't have any slides, and I'll keep my comments uh, brief uh, so we can have ample time for Q&A. Um, but I will absolutely agree with uh, with Lauren that uh, that uh, metrics are very important to track and to monitor. I think that um, as as uh, funders will be more interested in knowing and monitoring and tracking uh, analytics like Twitter analytics. Um, but I could also see that entering in faculty evaluations or progress reports. Um, these are ways that we can demonstrate our reach, the reach of our research. Um, but I'm going to chat just a little bit about some concrete examples on how uh, Twitter has benefited and broadened my professional network. Um, I always use Twitter at academic conferences. I'm always hashtagging uh, the conference. And that's a way to let other people know that I'm at that conference. So for instance, I go to Academy Health uh, 
every other year. And when I'm there, I'm uh, I'm tweeting and hashtagging uh, ARM or ARM uh, in the year. And then people see that on Twitter, like, and then I get DMs in uh, or direct messages saying, hey, let's go out for lunch. Let's grab a drink after the conference. Or I even, I've even had PhD students uh, DM me saying, hey, Professor Gonzalez, I, I enjoy your work. Would you have a few minutes uh, to chat about my dissertation project? And of course, these are great ways to uh, connect and, and to do so over the Twitter platform. Um, uh, and so Twitter has also been beneficial to me. Uh, it lets others know what type of research I'm doing. And I've been uh, invited to give uh, professional or talks at seminars or, uh, or at conferences because of Twitter. I think we're, we're all connected here today because of Twitter. Uh, that, I think that's how I first met Catherine uh, uh, prior to uh, today's uh, today's uh, pre-conference uh, seminar. But I would say that it's it's very beneficial. Um, and for the PhD students and graduate students out there, I would also encourage you to go on Twitter. It's a good way of letting us know what you're working on. I'm always looking to see what is the new research in LGBT health, who's working on what, who's using what novel data sets. And that lets me know that, you know, when you're on the job market, I already know who you are and I'm a fan of your work. If, if there's a postdoc or a faculty position here at Vanderbilt and I know your work, I'm, you're likely to get a, a, either a DM on Twitter or an email from me saying, hey, you should, you should consider applying for this job. Um, so I would highly encourage PhD students and graduate students to, uh, to start networking on Twitter. And I'll just wrap up with some do's and don'ts on Twitter. Um, and so some do's, um, I would encourage you to follow others, retweet others, and promote other LGBTQ health research. Um, I would encourage you to share your news and updates. Um, share your research on Twitter. Uh, I, it's, it can be as simple as just copying the abstract and an image of the abstract and posting on Twitter so that way people know what you're working on. Um, I would also encourage uh, using images and GIFs for more clicks. Uh, puppies, cats, dogs are always very popular. I will click every dog picture I see on Twitter because that's what gets me, uh, that's what gets my eyes uh, attention. And just some don'ts, uh, so things not to do on Twitter. Um, I would not recommend starting any fights, don't bully others, don't shame others on their research or what they may be doing. Um, that's, that's just kind of, uh, you don't wanna do that, especially if you're early in your career and it's just tacky. Uh, don't tweet something you don't want your employers or mentors to see. So just keep that in mind that this is a public platform and anyone can see, uh, can see what you're tweeting. And then lastly, uh, be mindful of uh, HIPAA and FERPA laws. And so you don't want to violate any, uh, any privacy or any information, personal information about patients you may be uh, taking care of or students in your classrooms. Always ask for permission to share uh, their, their images, their, their face on Twitter. Uh, and, and if you do, and what I, would, what I would do, if I'm tweeting about the students working in my lab, I always uh, black out uh, their names or anything that could, could personally identify them. And so, uh, and that's very important, especially when things are on, on, uh, on Zoom. And so I posted and tweeted uh, about my Zoom lab meetings. And I asked, I asked students for permission to share this on Twitter, but I also uh, just black out their name on that bottom corner so that way it protects their privacy and their information. Um, with that, that's all I've got and looking forward to Q&A. Thanks so much, Gilbert and Cindy. Um, that was great. Um, let me see what I have here on my next slide. Yes, Q&A. Um, perfect, so I think we have a fair amount of time. I think we still have about like 40 minutes left in the session. So um, I'll, I'll share some of the questions. This might not be everything. So if you kind of registered in the last like two or three days, I may not, I may not have your question up here, um, but these were some of the questions that some of the attendees had, um, and uh, maybe we can kind of, um, uh, you know, go through them and see um, if, if uh, there's anything that we want to, like, elaborate on or that we haven't answered, um, and if you have any particular questions, you're welcome to, like, pop them in the chat. I'll be taking a look at them. Um, and then after that, we'll, you know, we'll kind of go into our like hands on giving you time to explore Twitter um, and asking us questions while you do it. So um, the first question here is how can I transition to Twitter from a newbie's perspective? 
Um, and I think the second one is sort of somewhat related that a lot of early career researchers and trainees are using Twitter um, for networking. How can I support my students and postdocs to kind of do the same? So it's sort of speaking to this like, I'm not super familiar with it. How can I do it? Or how can I support people to do it? Um, any thoughts from our panelists? I can kind of collect my thoughts as, as you all react to this. Actually, I do have thoughts. So I will say that like, you know, sort of like, like I mentioned in the beginning, um, you know, when I was brand new to Twitter, I was like terrified of Twitter. I kind of had a private account. I just mostly lurked. You know, if you are just not sure if it's for you, you know, that's something that you can do. You can create an account. Um, and you can just kind of see what's out there. You can follow people um, and just sort of like passively um, kind of consume, uh, you know, the information. Um, you know, over time, I got comfortable with it. I actually made, I went from having a totally like private, like anonymous profile to actually putting my real name on it and putting my real photo on it and that sort of thing. Um, as I sort of got more comfortable with the idea of like sharing my own thoughts on Twitter. Um, and in the beginning, at least for me, it was really just a lot of trial and error. Like I would write a tweet and be like, this is too long or this is too vague. And, you know, it just was sort of giving it a shot and seeing, um, seeing what stuck, honestly, it was, it was, it was that for me. Um, and in terms of like my thoughts on um, supporting other people to, you know, use Twitter, um, at the end, I have a resource. Um, it's a, it's an ebook um, called Twitter for Academics, I believe. Um, let me just like skip ahead really quickly to, um, it's this one right here, Daniel Quintana Twitter for Scientists ebook. Um, it's a pretty comprehensive, just like how to that is freely available that I would highly recommend. Some of these other things are things that um, Cindy and uh, Cindy and Lauren shared, and these two are just blogs that kind of talk about you know kind of getting started on Twitter or considerations, particularly if you're a student. But this one right here, I have started because it's probably the most comprehensive one. Um, any other folks want to talk about sort of considerations when you're getting started? I have a comment about how mentors can help. I think um, modeling is a really positive way to use Twitter and to show people who are more junior that it can be a positive thing. And I think one of the things that I see some mentors do that I think is really lovely is calling out their trainees on Twitter and sharing their accomplishments um, sharing their good news that they have a publication and they win an award. Like, I think that's a really amazing use of Twitter and it can really call attention to more junior people um, using the power of more senior people's Twitter followers. And so using it in that positive way can show people who are more junior the ways that academic Twitter can be pretty amazing. Lauren Gilbert? or we can move on to the next questions. I would also just um, say that uh, timing, if when is it is the right time for me to start on Twitter? I did leap uh, right before uh, conference season. Uh, so yeah. that way I could hashtag the conferences I was attending. And that was really when I made the, the jump into Twitter. That's all I was gonna say, that this is the perfect time to join Twitter. And I think we now have in the chat, uh, a lot of people have Twitter already. And so you can, one thing I'm about to do is go through and follow every single person who puts your handle in the chat. So if you haven't done that already, think about it. <laughs> I would encourage others to do the same. And Catherine, there's a, a, a comment in the chat. On the other hand, Twitter can be very addictive. Uh, Yes. And so, you know, unfortunately, this is one of the downsides. It's Twitter is probably the first thing I open in the morning and the last thing I, I, I close at night before going to bed, uh, just because it, it, we live in this 24 hour news cycle. So it can be very addictive. Uh, and some some people uh, will just take breaks from Twitter. And that's very uh, that's very normal. And it's OK to say, hey, friends, I'm going to take a break from Twitter. Uh, see you in two months. Yes, absolutely. Um, great. The next question is, how do I keep the professionalism and still be able to be seen as reachable? So um, I know Cindy kind of spoke to this a bit in uh, her presentation. I don't know if anyone else or if Cindy wanted to kind of elaborate on that um, or, or underscore any points there. 
I think one of the things I talk about when I do my productivity presentation is that one of the challenges with academia is that we're not really great at sharing our struggles. Um, I think it can be really hard to talk about things that are hard in academia when we're not feeling productive, when we're feeling like we don't have focus. And I think one of the ways that we can be seen as reachable at is to share a little bit of the struggles that we're facing. I'm not talking about like sharing that you spent last night eating 12 pints of ice cream while crying over while watching beaches. But like, you know, if you have trouble managing deadlines or you have trouble um, sometimes saying no, that those kinds of things that are kind of common amongst all of us can be really helpful for other people to see that you're also a human. I think there's some people I follow on Twitter who only share the good stuff that's going on. And I think it can make them seem really unreachable, both like as Twitterers and also just as like academics that it can make it seem like they're they're just inhuman to some extent. Yeah, totally agree. And I think for me, like in my head, I have, I do share some personal stuff and I share some things that I struggle with on Twitter, but in my head, I have a pretty clear boundary of what I'm willing to share about my personal life and what I'm not willing to share. Um, so I think that thinking about that for yourself um, in, co in consideration of your career stage, um, in consideration of whether you see patients or clients or not, you know, I think all of those things are sort of important to consider um, when you decide like how much of your real self you want to show and like what parts of your real self you want to show. So, um, all right. Um, I think that a couple of things here are about like dissemination of papers, findings, um, promoting research participation um, and recruitment. So um, um, any perspectives on that before I jump in? I think one thing, and maybe this is Cindy who's done this um, a really a really good job of it, is breaking down like not just. I mean, I think that like like you can certainly just share your abstract and say like here's the abstract for my paper. Here's like the um, here's the like alt metric or not the alt metric link, but like you know the link from from the journal. Um, you know this paper is broadly about X, and I often do that because I'm sort of strapped for time, but. But in an ideal world, when I have a little bit more time, um, um, and I think Cindy does a really great job of this, is like talking about the study and saying like, what are the sort of takeaways from it? How is it relevant? Um, and and you don't have to fit that all into one tweet. You can add, um, you can you can create a thread. And um, I don't remember if we talked about this, but when you create a thread. Um, you can uh, you can add like onto them so they're all basically like stuck together and you don't have to publish them until you're sort of done composing the thread or you can add on to it sort of as you go. So um, so I think that's one great way to like talk about your paper and talk about the implications of your paper without having to you know expect the person to sort of read it. Um, and another way that I've seen that is 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 really effective is like kind of coupling, those um, sort of your takeaways from the paper with um, like infographics or like graphs or sort of like compelling um, compelling things that really like visually distill what you're trying to get out of it like very quickly. Yeah, I did that for a COVID paper that we published recently um, to sort of disseminate a lot of the different findings. It was kind of a complicated paper with a lot of different findings for different marginalized groups. And so I shared both the graphs from the paper and some of the findings. And one of the things that was I thought was interesting in doing that was to share some of the reviewer comments that we got along the way and how we dealt with it or things that I included because I was trying to address reviewer comments, but maybe I didn't necessarily agree with. And I thought that that was kind of an interesting um, way to do it. Uh, well, I was also going to say another thing that you can do is that if you um, tweet about your publications, it can increase your impact factor. Um, not your impact factor, your H index. It can increase the number of people who are citing you. Um, and if you have something that you, if you just get one more citation on that, that your H index will go up by one, like um, go for it. That's a really good way to get people to pay attention to your work. Yeah, and the other thing I wanna throw out there is that to think about your audience as being beyond academic Twitter because people, it, and it, you, can, you can do that crossover by the hashtags you use. So if you tag both academic Twitter and by Twitter, 
people across the spectrum, different audience spectrums will see it. And one thing that's really affirming for folks out there who are, you know, LGBTQIA plus identified um, or who are community activists is to see their identities and communities specifically referenced in your, in your data. So even if you don't have many people from a given population within your data set, it will mean a lot to people to see, oh, there were bisexual people in the study, there are asexual people in the study, there are non-binary people in this study, there are intersex people in this study, and like here are the findings for like black bisexual non-binary folks. Like, wow, I've I've always wanted to see myself represented in research and know what health outcomes are like for for, for people like me or for my community. And so that is really powerful. So when you're designing um, as a researcher, things like another thing you can do is make infographics or visual abstracts. You can make little videos that even just using something as simple as a PowerPoint and recording, you know, you can make little um, tools to, to play short videos and put them on Twitter. You can do a lot to, have, to let people know about how the research that you're doing affects people like them and about population health in ways that can be really empowering and validating for folks. Yeah, hundred percent. I think the last thing I'll say about that um, is that, you know, if you're wanting your work to get to, you know, somebody outside of academia, you can at mention a particular organization that you think that your work is relevant to. Um, you know, my work is um, does a lot of like, I do a lot of like adolescent health stuff. So I might tweet like the American Academy of Pediatrics or, you know, other sort of broader adolescent health or child health organizations um, that might be interested in the work that I do, or I might tweet at um, people who are like physician scientists who are in that field who can kind of tweet it to their folks and, and things like that. So, um, so those are ways that you can connect with people sort of outside of your area, but adjacent to your area and kind of build your network that way. So Gilbert, I didn't know if you were gonna say anything to add to that. Um, maybe not to this comment, but if I can uh, just make some comments or on the uh, question about uh, using Twitter to recruit participants in LGBTQ research. Um, I think Twitter is a, another great platform to recruit participants. Uh, I tried putting a QR code and I see Lauren shaking her head no. Uh, so I've, I've, I've done a little bit of that, and I, but I would also recommend uh, Facebook and Instagram ads for targeted advertisement. It's really affordable, and that's been um, a good way of recruiting uh, participants rather than Twitter. But, and I will also add that people are starting to do more research with uh, data from Twitter. So like around George Floyd uh, and people doing research on how people are talking about Black Lives Matter or in LGBT issues, um, what, how are people talking about marriage equality after the Supreme Court uh, extended marriage uh, rights? Uh, and, and I think more research will be using this, uh, this, these data from Twitter or from uh, Google Trends. I think exactly what uh, Gilbert was saying. I think there are pros and cons to using Twitter for recruitment. It gives you a unique sample. I think I've discovered that online samples can be more discussed than representative national samples. We use Twitter primarily for our COVID study. We got over 5,000 participants, which was really kind of unexpected. Um, but it was a distressed audience, obviously, because people who want to do a COVID study at the beginning of the pandemic are more distressed. There's some really good articles out there that talk about the good sides of internet research and getting your samples online that you can use to sort of address reviewer concerns. Um, and one of them is that if you're using it to look at relationships and not at like incidence rates, prevalence rates, but you're looking at associations between different variables, that that's a really good reason to use an internet sample and can be uh, a way to bolster that. Um, I've talked about some of that on Twitter. I've posted some resources specifically within LGBT research comparing national representative sample to a more online sample. Um, and so there's some really good stuff out there to use to support that. Cool, thank you. So sort of in the interest of time, I'm gonna, um, I saw that there's one question about threads, um, which we can answer really quickly, um, but we can kind of, um, go through these last couple of questions and then kind of pivot to um, the hands-on piece. Or you can go ahead and start. If you if you don't have a Twitter, please please feel free to go ahead and 
um, go ahead and start it and then we'll kind of pivot to the um, kind of workshop portion, um, which we'll close out with in just a second. But um, regarding the ethical considerations, you know, I think that 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 Twitter is a tool in my view. It's something that it's, I don't, I don't think that Twitter is like good or bad. I think that you can use it in ways that are helpful and advantageous to your work and to your um, community. And I think that there are ways that you can use it in not great ways. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, certainly, you know, you don't want to uh, like exploit people online um, or, or what have you, but I think that, um, you know, I think that, that that you can you can you know you can use this tool in a way that is um, that is helpful to you in your work um, while also recognizing that like maybe social media companies have like not great things going on. So I don't know if that was like a great answer, but I'll I'll see if anybody else wants to weigh in briefly um, um, before we kind of move on. Yeah, I think this is an important question um, for a lot of reasons. And for me, I particularly use Twitter to share research findings or to do community engagement because it is, you're, you're basically like a little mini journalist and you can really get the word out broadly in ways that you just can't do if you're not using Twitter. Uh, for a lot of th reasons, like people are using Twitter, um, they can to, to look at people's content who they don't know on like Facebook, you know, of course you can use Facebook or Instagram or other uh, social media platforms to engage with folks who you don't know that well, but it's much easy. it's really easy to do that on Twitter. And for uh, thinking about the reach of the, the possible influence and scope of reach of the scientific work that's being done or to, to share important events or news or findings with say LGBTQIA um, or other movement-based organizing circles. Like I just can't think of a tool that's not um, social media to really effectively do that. And so I think that the way, for me, the ways that I use Twitter justify why it can be a net good in terms of the impact of doing so. I know other people feel differently, um, especially there's been a lot of critiques of other platforms that have come out with you know, unethical data sharing practices, um, selling people's information, having big data get linked up across multiple sources and using that to perpetuate inequity. There's a lot of important conversations that are out there. I think it's, it's really, I think, helpful to be aware of what those are. But for me, the way I use it, um, to, I think, I can't think of a, another way to reach people that isn't using these platforms. So. And, and I think reaching people with this information is really important and beneficial. Cool, and this last question here, how can you help Europe start hashtag Europe LGBT in healthcare? I don't know if the person who um, asked that question is on here, but you know, I think um, if you attend the conference and you know you kind of are wanting to tweet about your movement, um, I would couple it with the LGBTQ health conf um, hashtag and, you know, we'll help you retweet it, I think. I, you know, I kind of defer to Lauren on that, but I don't know if there's any more specific advice you would give there. Ah, even just being on here and put a tweet out and say that you want to start it and then like every person on here could retweet you. <laughs> put your tweet in the chat and like tag in I think we should start using the LGBTQ health comp uh, hashtag right now so you could do that right now and start to get it you know start to get it moving also register your hashtag so that you can keep tracking it and see who is is tweeting it as you use your hashtag like make sure that you go and you put your hashtag into Twitter and then pull up all of the tweets that use the hashtag and then you can reply to each one. You can thank folks, you can ask them to retweet it and share it because of you know making it clear like that there's a really compelling reason why you want this hashtag to exist and the good it will do. Like you can start to really just build some momentum that way. And like another thing you can do is develop social media community partnerships so I've even gone so far as to create agreements with, you know, little draft uh, word documents that say like, okay, I'm Lauren, I'm with Chicago Bisexual Health Task Force, or I'm with the Visibility Impact Fund, or I'm with whatever organization I'm, I'm repping. 
and I say, okay, I agree to share the content of my sexual resource center for Bi Health Month, and you agree to retweet CBHTF to share our content and events, and like we have a little mini agreement, and we uh, use those to boost each other's presence and work, and so that can be really helpful too, just like using basically what I would call, I mean, for just community organizing methods uh, online to, um, to, to increase the spread and reach of your, your hashtag. Cool. All right, well, um, I'm gonna answer Chris Owens's question in a second, um, but I think we can move into the sort of final part of our, um, our time here, which is really a choose your own adventure. Um, you know, we'd like for you all to spend the last like 15 minutes or so just playing around with Twitter, following some of the people who are in attendance today, um, you know, exploring the Twitter features and settings. If you if you scroll up to um, Sarah Quain's chat, which is like, I think maybe like five chats ago, um, Sarah posted um, a list of some of the LGBTQ health conference speakers and organizations. So you can follow that list or, um, you know, uh, um, see who's on it. Um, Kimberly Balsam had something that um, they wanted us to retweet. So feel free to retweet that. Um, you know, feel free to explore any of the resources that folks kind of um, talked about, like um, uh, the Twitter analytics um, that Lauren talked about, hashtags, lists, whatever. Um, you know, write a tweet that uses our hashtag um, and, you know, kind of at mention some of us maybe. Um, and then feel free to ask us anything as you do it. So, um, you know, we'll give you the last few minutes to do that. And as as y'all explore that, I can talk a little bit um, about um, tweet threads. I think um, I, I feel like I've seen a lot of Cindy's tweet threads lately, so maybe I'll defer to Cindy, but I think, can you talk more about how to make a successful thread as well as how to use Twitter that encourages engagement and conversations? Um, you know, drawing on some of the things that, that folks said a little bit earlier, you know, making, um, you know, including, uh, media like links or GIFs or um, images or emojis or whatever in each of your tweets can help um, it get more visibility. Um, uh, I think that often when I do a thread, I try to summarize what my thread is about in like the very first tweet so that people will know what thing, you know, like what to expect and then sort of point them down with a little like pointing down emoji or something to that effect. And then um, there's a little plus sign um, to the bottom like right of, of your sort of like like tweet box area that you can just keep adding you know new tweets to and you can publish them all at the same time. Um, another thing that I find helpful um, to get a sense for how long I will be reading is sometimes people will say there are like 10 tweets here, like one out of 10 or like one out of N knowing that like there's sort of an open-ended um, you know thread that somebody might keep adding to. Um, anybody else want to weigh in here? I, I wish that Twitter would automatically number them because they know when you're doing a thread, so they should be able to just automatically do it because it's really kind of a pain to write this perfect tweet and then have to go back up and add the number and then you have to delete words from your perfect tweet because you're over the numbers. I use Twitter threads a lot because I, I really like nuance. I like to talk about things that are complex and you can't do that in a single tweet. Um, and I think some of the best engagement I've had on tweets is like when I try to talk about some of the big things like reflexivity and identity within LGBT health research or how we're all measuring gender identity in LGBT health research, the two-step method. I think it's been really interesting to have those conversations. They're complex and I get a lot of really good feedback and interactions with those. And I think one of the best ways to get interactions is to do a poll. Everyone loves polls for some reason. Everyone loves to um, choose something from a poll and people will often share their experiences um, on it. So yeah, I like Twitter threads quite a bit. I wish that they were automatically numbered. I think using, as Catherine was saying, using GIFs is a really helpful way to get people to pay attention to it. And having some sort of like super sexy first tweet that's gonna get people to wanna read more can be really helpful. I often tweet my entire presentations from things like a slide from, like all of the slides from a presentation because I like to share what I'm doing broadly, and I think that that gets a lot of engagement as well. Yeah, 
Yeah, one thing that I really liked that Cindy suggested when we were planning this session that I'm going to start doing, and as, as you've seen here that I've done on these slides, is include um, Twitter handles on every single slide so that if someone does screenshot your slide or screenshot your presentation, your um, it's it can be attributed to you, that person um, can find you if the person who screenshotted and shared your information, um, you know, didn't, uh, um, you know, didn't necessarily like attribute it to you in their own tweet, etc. So, um, so that's something um, that I've learned from Cindy just in the last couple of weeks. And I figured that out because there was an HIV conference two years ago and one of the presenters used neon color scheme in it and I became completely obsessed with the color scheme that they used in that presentation. And no one, everyone tweeted the slides and the graphs, but no one tweeted who it was that did the presentation. And I was like cursing them because I really wanted to find that person and steal their like color palette. While you're formulating your questions, I'll advance to the next slide, which is again, um, a plug for our conference. Um, please um, remember to register for the conference. Um, it is over two half days next month, Thursday, May 20th and Friday, May 21st. We really tried to find a block of time that would work for anybody regardless of um, you know, the time zone that you're in. Um, your registration fee includes entrance to both um, days of the conference, including the keynote and symposia. Um, we'll have some folks from the NIH um, Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office there to talk about priorities, um, as well as um, a program officer who um, oversees a lot of like the training um, awards that are given at NIH um, and our virtual poster session. So um, posters should be up on our website a couple weeks before the conference. So we encourage folks to go visit the website, go um, uh, you know, like tweet about them, you know, to kind of increase um, engagement and connection with other people. And um, if, if for whatever reason you don't have access to funds, you know, we have a generous um, fee waiver policy. So please, you know, consider applying for that. I believe the deadline for fee waiver applications is May 6th. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming up. Any tips on deciding on a Twitter handle? So Cindy says, something easy to type out and spell. I wish I didn't use my whole name because no one can remember or spell my last name. Yeah, I, you know, I think, you know, to somebody's point earlier, having something, if you want to use it for professional purposes, using some variant of your name or something that has part of your name in it, I think works. Um, my Twitter handle is the email address that I had in graduate school that they just like came up for like they, they gave to me and is like a combination of like my first middle and last names but it comes up with two words which I thought was cute so I stuck with it but I don't know I don't know how useful it is to other people um let's see thanks Cindy um what are the best ways to look for job opportunities posted on Twitter I mean, follow a lot of people in your field. You know, I mean, I think that that to me is the way that I hear about a lot of job opportunities. Um, I've posted job opportunities on Twitter before. So I would say like whoever you're interested in, see if they have a lab Twitter or like an academic, you know, sort of a personal sort of Twitter handle and follow them. And a lot of times you will just sort of, they'll just kind of come across your feed to be honest. Um, are there ways to shape what you see in your feed? Certain topics appear a lot. Not sure if there's a way to make some appear more often or shift the balance. Um, anyone have, I don't actually, I mean, I think that it's just about what you engage with, right? Like the algorithm shows you what you tend to engage with more. So, um, but if anybody has any kind of specific feedback on that. Oh, I see Kim says, one key is to curate who you follow. I follow so many people that I don't necessarily get the tweets I most want to read. I think that can be really helpful of, you know, curating who you follow is really, really helpful. And the other thing you can do is make lists yourself. Like you can go into your own Twitter and then make a list and you can make different lists for different topics. So you can make a list that's academic Twitter. You can make a list that's by Twitter. You can make a list that's LGBTQ health comp. You can make a list, you know, like, and what you do to make that though, is you actually put people's accounts in to the list and then you can just filter who you look at that way. And it's not going to be a solution to like, how do I have actual control over the content of my entire feed? 
but you can, you know, decide I only want to look at uh, content from people who tweet on pre predominantly these different topics that I have listed. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. So notifications that I've been added to, right? So do people have weird reactions to being added to other people's lists? It boosts your uh, engagement and stuff. <laughs> like it'll boost like your, if you, back in the day, there used to be like this thing called clout and like there are other and search, you know, different tools that monitor the, the reach and impact of your social media accounts. If you get listed, it boosts those types of scores. I'm, and Twitter is public. So when people list me, like I, I just take it as a compliment. And if you're concerned who's looking at your tweets, then you can protect your account. But I kind of think that goes against the idea of why people use Twitter. A couple other things that are coming up. Um, Cheng Lin says, I'm a student here, and I think what I also learned on Twitter is don't be afraid of adding other people when disseminating information studies. Yeah, I think that, you know, going back to the networking piece, like when you are in in person conferences, bumping into somebody can be sort of a passive thing. But on Twitter, you know, a little thing, something that's a little bit different about it is that you kind of have to actively reach out to people um, and at people and mention people and tell people that you like their work. Um, um, it's, you know, it's always flattering to hear that people are interested in what you're doing and, and um, you know, want to connect with you. Um, and, you know, if you at somebody and they don't want to hear it, you know, like they don't want the notifications to come up anymore, they can mute your tweet or whatever. So, I mean, I think that if you're selectively sort of at mentioning people when you're disseminating stuff, I think that that, you know, that is fine. Um, Sarah says tweet deck can help you follow certain people and hashtags outside your re regular feed. And then there's a comment here from Jasmine about my Twitter handle came from a time when I was performing poetry more, but now I'm not sure if I want to change it because I haven't in 10 plus years. Would it be better to change for my future research endeavors? And Cindy says it could make you stand out and be a conversation starter. Yeah, I think part of Part of the nice thing about Twitter is that you can sort of decide to share those pieces of yourself if you want. And, you know, maybe in the future, Jasmine, like people will remember you about, you know, because you are a researcher and a poet or something like that. Um, but you can also change, you know, you can also change, um, you know, your name, your handle if you want to. I think there's some implications if you have like a check, a blue check, if you're verified on Twitter and you change your name, I think you might lose that. Um, I'm not verified, so I'm not worried about that, but that may be something to consider if you have a ton of followers. Oh, that uh, reminds, oh, sorry. It's, oh, it's yeah, also- I, Oh, go ahead, Lori. Uh, it's, if you change your name, like it will be harder to get, get verified in the first place and Twitter can look at it as a security risk. So you might consider starting another account, but if you want to keep your followers on there, you can change your name, but there are some things that come along with that. And then the other thing I would say is that enable two-factor authentication on your Twitter account. Like there are ways to keep things. Um, I, I have done that for a number of years. I think it helps with security on, on Twitter and social media. And I just would say that's a good idea if you, if you can do that, if you use Twitter on your smartphone. Yeah, totally. Um, I just flipped the slide to some of the selected resources that I showed a little bit earlier. Again, the Twitter for Scientists ebook is probably the most in-depth one, um, but these are just, I mean, you could do a Google and find other ones yourself, but these are the ones that, um, you know, kind of came across when we were preparing for this, um, for this session. Yeah, so Jasmine says, this is random, but I engage with Verizon and other businesses via DM and receive better customer service. I mean, I know that definitely happens. If you have a complaint about an airline or something, they will respond to you on Twitter. Um, and puppy photos and gifts. Yes, everybody loves seeing cute things on Twitter. I mean, most people do. Um, so we are about at time. Thank you all so much for your questions and your engagement. Thank you to the presenters and the panelists for joining me on this wild ride. Um, we have recorded the session. So if you know folks who were interested but couldn't make it for whatever reason, um, we'll try to make it available on our, um, on our website. And we hope to see you, um, a lot of you with the conference in uh, just over a month. So, um, 
Thank you all so much. Please feel free to reach out via Twitter with any questions that you might have that are kind of like lingering. Now that we're all connected, that is something that you can do. So, um, all right, everyone, take care.